Well, good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to the start of this new week. My name is Hunter. I am your brother, your Bible reading coach, someone who shows up with you every day to spend some time together in the pages of the Bible. And we're about to let the Bible do what it does and direct our hearts to the one who is the living word of God, the one alone who has the words of life. And so we come from far and wide, sisters and brothers are gathering themselves now to warm their hearts by the fires of God's love. For God is love. And today, we're going to look into the book of Judges. That's where we'll start chapters 1 through 3, and then we'll finish in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is the word of the Lord. Judges 1. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, Which tribe should go first to attack the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah, for I have given them victory over the land. The men of Judah said to their relatives from the tribe of Simeon, Join us to fight against the Canaanites living in the territory allotted to us. Then we will help you conquer your territory. So the men of Simeon went with Judah. When the men of Judah attacked The Lord gave them victory over the Canaanites and Perizzites, and they killed 10,000 enemy warriors at the town of Bezek. While at Bezek, they encountered King Adonai Bezek and fought against him, and the Canaanites and Perizzites were defeated. Adonai Bezek escaped, but the Israelites soon captured him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Adonai Bezek said, I once had 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off, eating scraps from under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. They took him to Jerusalem, and he died there. The men of Judah attacked Jerusalem and captured it, killing all its people and setting the city on fire. Then they went down to fight the Canaanites living in the hill country, the Negev, and the western foothills. Judah marched against the Canaanites in Hebron, formerly called Kiryat Araba, defeating the forces of Sheshiah, Ahiman, and Talmai. From there they went to fight against the people living in the town of Debir, formerly called Kiriath Sephir. Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the one who attacks and captures Kiriath Sephir. Othaniel, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kanaz, was the one who conquered it, so Aksa became Othaniel's wife. When Aksa married Othaniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. As she got down from her donkey, Caleb asked her, What's the matter? She said, Let me have another gift. You have already given me land in the Negev. Now please give me springs of water too. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. When the tribe of Judah left Jericho, the city of Palms, the Kenites, who were descendants of Moses' father-in-law, traveled with them into the wilderness of Judah. They settled among the people there, near the town of Arad in the Negev. Then Judah joined Simeon to fight against the Canaanites living in Zaphath, and they completely destroyed the town. So the town was named Hormah. In addition, Judah captured the towns of Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron, along with their surrounding territories. The Lord was with the people of Judah, and they took possession of the hill country, but they failed to drive out the people living in the plains, who had iron chariots. The town of Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had promised, and Caleb drove out the people living there, who were descendants of the three sons of Anak. The tribe of Benjamin, however, failed to drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. So to this day the Jebusites live in Jerusalem, among the people of Benjamin. The descendants of Joseph attacked the town of Bethel, and the Lord was with them. They sent men to scout out Bethel, formerly known as Luz. They confronted a man coming out of the town and said to him, Show us a way into the town, and we will have mercy on you. So he showed them a way in, and they killed everyone in the town except the man and his family. Later, the man moved to the land of the Hittites, where he built a town. He named it Luz, which is its name to this day. The tribe of Manasseh failed to drive out the people living in Beit Shan, Tanakh, Dor, Iblim, Megiddo, and all their surrounding settlements. Because the Canaanites were determined to stay in that region, when the Israelites grew stronger, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves. But they never did drive them completely out of the land. The tribe of Benjamin failed to drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, so the Canaanites continued to live there among them. The tribe of Zebulun failed to drive out the residents of Kitron, 
and Nahalo. So the Canaanites continued to live among them. But the Canaanites were forced to work as slaves for the people of Zebulun. The tribe of Asher failed to drive out the residents of Akko, Sidon, Ahalab, Akzib, Helba, Afik, and Rehob. Instead, the people of Asher moved in among the Canaanites who controlled the land, for they failed to drive them out. Likewise, the tribe of Naphtali failed to drive out the residents of Beit Shemash and Beit Anath. Instead, they moved in among the Canaanites who controlled the land. Nevertheless, the people of Beit Shemesh and Beit Anath were forced to work as slaves for the people of Naphtali. As for the tribe of Dan, the Amorites forced them back into the hill country and would not let them come down into the plains. The Amorites were determined to stay in Mount Heres, Ajalon, and Shalabim. But when the descendants of Joseph became stronger, they forced the Amorites to work as slaves. The boundary of the Amorites ran from Scorpion Pass to Salah and continued upward from there. Judges 2. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said to the Israelites, I brought you out of Egypt into this land that I swore to give to your ancestors, and I said I would never break my covenant with you. For your part, you were not to make any covenants with the people living in this land. Instead, you were to destroy their altars. But you disobeyed my command. Why did you do this? So now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land. They will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a constant temptation for you. When the angel of the Lord finished speaking to all the Israelites, the people wept loudly. So they called the place Bokim, which means weeping, and they offered sacrifices there to the Lord. After Joshua sent the people away, each of the tribes left to take possession of the land allotted to them, And the Israelites served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the leaders who outlived him, those who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land he had been allocated at Timnath Serah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshipping the gods of the people around them, and they angered the Lord. They abandoned the Lord to serve Baal in the images of Ashtoreth. They made the Lord burn with anger against Israel. So he handed them over to raiders who stole their possessions. He turned them over to their enemies all around, and they were no longer able to resist them. Every time Israel went out to battle, the Lord fought against them, causing them to be defeated, just as he had warned. And the people were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges to rescue the Israelites from their attackers. Yet Israel did not listen to the judges, but prostituted themselves by worshipping other gods, How quickly they turned away from the path of their ancestors, who had walked in obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge over Israel, he was with that judge and rescued the people from their enemies throughout the judge's lifetime. For the Lord took pity on his people, who were burdened by oppression and suffering. But when the judge died, the people returned to their corrupt ways, behaving worse than those who had lived before them. They went after other gods, serving and worshipping them, and they refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. So the Lord burned with anger against Israel. He said, Because these people have violated my covenant, which I made with their ancestors, and have ignored my commands, I will no longer drive out the nations that Joshua left unconquered when he died. I did this to test Israel, to see whether or not they would follow the ways of the Lord as their ancestors did. That is why the Lord left those nations in place. He did not quickly drive them out or allow Joshua to conquer them all. Judges 3 These are the nations that the Lord left in the land to test those Israelites who had not experienced the wars of Canaan. He did this to teach warfare to generations of Israelites who had no experience in battle. These are the nations, the Philistines, those living under the five Philistine rulers, all the Canaanites, Sidonians, and the Hivites living in the mountains of Lebanon, from Mount Baal-Harmon to Lebo-Hamath. 
These people were left to test the Israelites, to see whether they would obey the commands the Lord had given to their ancestors through Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and they intermarried with them. Israelite sons married their daughters, and the Israelite daughters were given in marriage to their sons. And the Israelites served their gods. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They forgot about the Lord their God, and they served the images of Baal and the Asherah poles. Then the Lord burned with anger against Israel, and he turned them over to King Cushan Rishtaim of Aram Neharaim. And the Israelites served Cushan Rishtaim for eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Othaniah, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Canaz. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he became Israel's judge. He went to war against King Cushan Rishtaim of Aram, and the Lord gave Othaniah victory over him. So there was peace in the land for forty years. Then Othaniah, son of Canaz, died. Once again the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. And the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. Eglon enlisted the Ammonites and Amalekites as allies. And then he went out and defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palms. And the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for eighteen years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Ehud, son of Gerar, a left-handed man of the tribe of Benjamin. The Israelites sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to King Eglon of Moab. So Ehud made a double-edged dagger that was about a foot long, and he strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden under his clothing. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very fat. After delivering the payment... Ehud started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. But when Ehud reached the stone idols near Gilgal, he turned back. He came to Eglon and said, I have a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, Be quiet! And he sent them all out of the room. Ehud walked over to Eglon, who was sitting alone in a cool upstairs room, and Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. As King Eglon rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, pulled out the dagger strapped to his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. The dagger went in so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat, so Ehud did not pull out the dagger and the king's bowels emptied. Then Ehud closed and locked the doors of the room and escaped down the latrine. After Ehud was gone, the king's servants returned and found the doors to the upstairs room locked. They thought he might be using the latrine in the room, so they waited. But when the king didn't come out after a long delay, they became concerned and got a key, and when they opened the doors, they found their master dead on the floor. While the servants were waiting... Ehud escaped, passing the stone idols on his way to Sirah. When he arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, Ehud sounded a call to arms. Then he led a band of Israelites down from the hills. Follow me, he said, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab, your enemy. So they followed him, and the Israelites took control of the shallow crossings of the Jordan River across from Moab, preventing anyone from crossing. They attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of their strongest and most able-bodied warriors. Not one of them escaped. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for 80 years. After Ehud, Shamgar, son of Anath, rescued Israel, he once killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. 1 Corinthians 12 now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshipping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, 
but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another Spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews and some are Gentiles, some are slaves and some are free. But we all have been baptized into one body, by the Spirit, and we all share the same Spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that doesn't make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First are apostles, second are prophets, third are teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, those who speak in unknown languages. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And now, Lord, the Lord of life. We ask your blessing on the reading and the hearing of your word. Amen. You have a part to play. You have your own note to add to God's great symphony. You get to add your sound to God's amazing symphonic masterpiece. We actually get the word personality from the Latin word persona, literally meaning your sound. God has created you to offer your own note. He wants you to offer your sound to his great song. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, we are God's masterpiece. That word masterpiece in the Greek is poema, which means poem. And God has expertly crafted you to be right in the place where you are, to be who you are. In learning to play our part, we must learn to accept our own humanity. And you should do this because God has. God has accepted your humanity. He's accepted all of humanity. He became one of us. Beyond that, he knows you. He knows all your secrets. He knows how frail you are. As the prophet says, he knows that we are but dust. But he also 
knows that now in Christ, you have become a partaker in the divine nature of God himself. You are deeply valued and cherished by God. And part of our journey is learning to discover what it means to be a partaker in the divine life of God. This does not mean that you are God, but it does mean that God has embraced you into his life. You are his child. We must learn both of these things as we learn to play our part in God's symphony, our humanity, and our participation in God's divinity. And that lived out will begin to look like the giving of oneself, being radically forgiving in life, and learning to suffer alongside those who are in pain. Self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love. This is what it looks like to live as the masterpiece that you really are. And that's a prayer that I have for my own soul. That's a prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, and my son. And that's a prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Well, hey, hey, dear ones. I hope that you had a good weekend. I hope that you are somewhat rested, ready to begin this new work week. And as you begin, let me just remind you to take it one day at a time. The day's troubles are sufficient for that day, (laughs) so there's no need to add up all the troubles you see coming down the pike. No, you take it one day at a time, and God will give you the wisdom, He'll give you the perseverance and the stamina to make it through. And as you make it through, let me encourage you to enjoy life's simple pleasures with those that you love. Listen to some good music, eat some good food, breathe deep, and say thank you. Those are good things. Those are things worth doing. So let's do that. Hey, let me encourage you this week, if you haven't done it already, to sign up for our email newsletter that comes out about once a month. We try to bless you in that newsletter. We try to give you something. We try to encourage you. We try to inform you as well, but it's more important to us to find a way to give and serve in that newsletter. So if you haven't signed up for it, check it out. You can do that at our webpage, dailyradiobible.com. And while I'm talking about serving, hey, if there are ways that you see that this podcast and this ministry can serve you, serve the community, the DRB community, be sure to let us know. You know, we want to prayerfully consider how best we can serve. And some of that requires some feedback. So we are open to your feedback for sure. And would appreciate any of the insight that you offer. You can do that by emailing us at hunter at dailyradiobible.com. And last of all, just want to remind you that this podcast and our other podcasts are all entirely listener supported so if you'd like to partner with heather and i to make sure these podcasts continue to happen every day you can do that by going to the webpage dailyradiobible.com and clicking on the donate link well i'm going to be on my way now but what do you say we all show up again here tomorrow and we'll do it again we'll take tomorrow as it comes one day at a time one day at a time Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this, that you are loved. No doubt about it. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.